let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this morning. Amen. It has been said that the blind often see better than people who have physical sight, supposedly because they have to rely more heavily on their other senses, hearing, smell, touch. Today, meet Bartimaeus, who most definitely relies heavily on what he cannot see and is healed for his efforts. What stands out about Bartimaeus is that he calls Jesus by name, attaching the impressive title of Son of David without ever actually having met him. In fact, he not only calls out, he actually creates quite a ruckus. And onlookers try to shush him, but undeterred, he demands mercy. Blind and parked on the roadside, he wants only mercy. He doesn't even specify the nature of mercy until Jesus puts the question to him plainly. When Jesus responds with, call him, the crowd quickly changes its tune to say, take courage, get up. He is calling you. And Bartimaeus tosses his cloak aside in his eagerness. He may be blind, but he obviously isn't lame because he sprang up. On receiving his sight, he learns your faith has made you well. A statement applied only to one other person in the Gospel of Mark. The woman with the issue of blood. She too was determined to have contact with Jesus when he passed by in the midst of the crowd. Now restored to sight, Bartimaeus doesn't go your way as Jesus instructed, but followed him on the way as a new disciple. Take courage. Get up. He's calling you. This is an invitation, a mantra, a threefold charge, if you will, worth considering. It is an invitation to be a be of good cheer reformation, a stand up and speak out reformation, an answering to God's call. Reformation, and it points to the fact that the future of the church might just be at stake. And I really believe this. I know what you're thinking. Bartimaeus did not have the church in mind, let alone the potential outlook of the institution that we hold dear. But we would do well to look for and rely on biblical model, models for what the heart of the church should be and what is essential for its survival. And Bartimaeus is just that biblical character, just that biblical example who shows us what church is and exposes what church is not. Bartimaeus just might be the reformer that we need right now. He just might be the one who could set a new reformation in motion. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say that the church needs a reformation, I'm not talking about securing the answer to declining membership, fixing the lukewarm denominationalism, or solving the dilemma of closing churches. I am not talking about how to overhaul lower attendance problems, how to answer where have all the young people gone, how to ensure that the future is the children. I'm not talking about 
how to attract new members, get more seminarians enrolled in theological education, or write better strategic plans. This is all a backward looking kind of reformation, a nostalgia for what once was reformation, a reformation that defaults to entrenchment, giving in to fear in the face of those who feign a confidence that they don't really have. And to be honest, I don't think the church is dying. Rather, I think the church and those structures and systems and seminaries connected to it has lost its soul. And we are in need of a reformation, big time. You can tell when something or someone has lost its soul. Complacency and compliance are easy outs. Bottom lines trump core commitments. And voices of questions and dissension get overridden. Procedures replace people and policies are chosen over relationships. Disagreement is just swept under the rug. And most offensive those to whom we should be listening are systemically and systematically pushed to the periphery, deemed theoretical at best, problematic at worst. Maintaining the status quo is not the nature of the church. Never has and never should be. The gospel upends that which has been streamlined and that which has been deemed acceptable by the masses. The gospel demands to be heard even when rejection is sure to be the response. The gospel insists on the fact that the shaping of moral imagination is its duty and the church has lost its soul by giving up that responsibility by choosing fear over good cheer by staying seated instead of standing up by turning away from God's call because the way might just jeopardize the broken and dysfunctional systems that keep it afloat the church desperately needs a take courage get up, he is calling you, kind of reformation. A reformation with courage and heart at its center that doesn't sit there silently, but answers God's call to resistance and persistence and then follows along that way. Recognizing an ecological God instead of an economical God Believing in a creational God instead of a transactional God. Trusting in a Trinitarian God instead of a two-dimensional God. A reformation is needed that doesn't listen to the loudest voices out there. Those voices that simply support the idols of prestige and privilege, of patriarchy and power, but challenges those voices, insisting that the gospel word is the liberating word that might truly save this world. I imagine that take courage, get up. He is calling you were words that Luther might have heard reverberating in the abuses of the Catholic hierarchy, or Father Oscar Romero in the singing of the campesinos that he pastored, or Martin Luther King in the footsteps of the marchers in Selma, or Harvey Milk in the declarations of his LGBTQA constituents. Anyone willing to stand up to rejection to keep on persisting even in the face of rebuke knows what it means to maintain a reforming spirit. The voices of resistance to reformation are loud and strong. The opinions of those who have miraculously managed to determine the objects 
of God's love, which do not include the marginalized or the minoritized, are held up as truth. Those who both tolerate and perpetuate injustice in the name of God, in the name of the church, have the upper hand. Those who stay silent when two people are gunned down because they're a different color. Those who stay silent when 11 people are killed as they worship because they are a different faith. Those who stay silent as bombs are sent to those with different opinions. Getting on board with Bartimaeus will not be easy. Not even close. But risk and resolve is central to reformation. We should be willing to act as a balm for all wounds. And when the church forgets this, well, then it no longer has any business being church. All we can manage these days, and also all that really matters, is that we safeguard that little piece of God in ourselves and in others. We must defend God's dwelling place inside all of us. Ultimately, we just have one moral duty, to reclaim large areas of peace in ourselves, and more and more peace, and then to reflect it toward others and the more peace there is in us, the more peace there will also be in this troubled world. Will we, the church, take heart, embody courage, and be of good cheer? Will we, the church, get up and stand up? Will we, the church, answer God's call and then follow? How we the church respond to these questions will indeed defer, determine the reformation of our very soul, the continuation of our call, the perpetuation and proliferation of peace, and the survival of our mission. Amen.